Welcome to the Modern Athenas podcast with Sonia and Debbie, where we discuss how regular women became Athenas in their own time by working hard, persevering through the challenges in their lives, and contributing to a better world. This is podcast 32. On today's podcast, we'll be discussing the book, Waiting, The True Confessions of a Waitress by Deborah Ginsberg. As we continue our series of podcasts dedicated to ordinary women who persevere through challenges to find their own way through their life, we bring you Deborah's story. As you listen today, think about Deborah's self-reliance, resiliency, and ability to manage high levels of stress, all skills she has developed out of necessity through her years of waitressing. Then think about skills that you have developed through your career out of necessity. Those skills are valuable as you continue to find your way through your life journey. Make sure you add them to your toolkit. Deborah has been a waitress since her teenage years when she first helped her father through the summers in upstate New York. Since then, she has worked at a variety of restaurants and has gathered stories and experiences that would make even the most jaded restaurant critic laugh. Her true confessions are part memoir, part social commentary. Overworked waitstaff, demanding customers, trysts between chefs and waitstaff and waiters and waitresses, passive-aggressive behavior, the nightly theater in the dining room, management's often arbitrary standards, the transient nature of the job, the disdain of calling waiting a profession, and the emotions of living the life of a waitress, one day at a time, are all described by Deborah in a way that leaves you emotionally charged for nearly 300 pages. We pick up her describing the center of the waitress world, the tip. Quote, the major motivator is the tip. Tipping is the raisin d'etre of a restaurant, considered an absolute right by those on the receiving end. Thou shalt not screw with the tip. The tip is everything. Not only that, but it isn't like it's that easy to get a tip. Tipping creates a bizarre psychology. The customer holds the server's fate in their pocket. This imbues the customer with a certain amount of power as soon as he sits down at the table. And power, as the saying goes, corrupts. In a way, the server is immediately placed on the defensive. Her livelihood is not determined so much by whether or not she takes an order correctly, brings the food on time, or smiles often. Rather, she must gauge a customer's mood, pick up cues as to his background, and based on all of this, anticipate his needs and wants. The server is effectively the customer's private dancer for the two hours he sits at her table. Every diner is different. Some are impossible to please and would rather leave a lousy tip, even if their waitress offered them a full body massage, never mind a light touch on the shoulder. Others will tip high if their server just leaves them alone and remains invisible. The fact that there is no way of telling which way it's going to go with a particular table is part of the challenge and the excitement of waiting. Natural disasters and lazy busboys notwithstanding, how I fare on a particular table, night or week, is entirely up to me and my ability to mold myself to the customer. While good tips are wonderful and unexpected, bad tips feel deeply personal. End quote. Deborah talks about all kinds of bad tipping experiences. Sometimes it's the ignorance of European tourists that here in the U.S. don't know that you have to tip your servers. Sometimes it's just a rude customer refusing to tip. Other times it's an arbitrary decision by the customer to punish the server for something that wasn't the server's issue. And sometimes it's because the customer just didn't like the server. There isn't much one can do in the face of the disaster. You just have to move on and not take it as personally as it feels. Because the next table is waiting and you need their tip to cover the one that they just missed. Quote, Generally, fear of losing my job keeps me from making any kind of fuss over a bad tip. Ultimately, I found it evens out. End quote. For better or for worse, customers are instantly categorized as soon as the waiter approaches the table, sometimes even earlier. But pigeonholing any customer before the end of a meal is a dangerous game. There is a lottery aspect to the whole thing. Again, this is part of the job's challenge and one of its joys as well as, its one, as well as one of its pitfalls. This is also why so many waiters and waitresses dislike preset tips, despite the fact that such tips remove a certain anxiety from the process. Not only is there no incentive to excel when the tip has already been determined, but there is no possibility of receiving a bonanza at the end. In short, the thrill is gone. So the reason that we wanted to start by talking about tips is this gives you a quick glimpse into the life of a server or a waiter or waitress. Uh, basically, they have to be a psychologist. They have two hours and they got to determine what the person at the table wants um, or doesn't want so that they can get a tip. In essence, each table is a new patient. Um, and I, I, I just found this completely fascinating. 
Yeah, I think we could all relate to uh, seeing people who uh, are just, you know, upset or they say, oh, I'd like this on the menu, but can you do this, this, this and that and the other to it? And then there's this complicated order. Um, It juxtaposed with the person who just wants to maybe have a table for one, a quiet dinner, and they're, you know, just trying to not talk to anybody and, and just knowing where that line is and how much to what kind of person to be for that customer. It's just such a fascinating, um, you know, ever changing and kind of almost like fragile environment. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because you have to do like that quick read when you walk up to the table and you talk to people for the very first time, you know, like, hi, my name is blank and I'll be your server for tonight. And you've got to do that quick read on who are these people? You know, it's like you walk up to a couple, like, are they having a good night? Are they not? Do you want, do they want you to talk to them a lot? Do they not? Do they want you to read the specials? Do they not? Are you, you know, do they find you invasive? Do they not? Um, I can't imagine as a server how quickly you've got to do that entire analysis um, because the next time that you come back to the table, they're going to either want you there or they're not. Um, And I'm sure that all that affects the tip. I mean, it does for me. um, And so I'm sure that it does, you know, for other people as well. Well, and the other thing that I think Deborah starts to lay out here, and we we see this kind of, and we'll, we'll talk about throughout the podcast, is almost like, what contributes to her longevity as a waitress. And I I think it comes down to almost that one sentence in a way, uh, you know, ultimately, she found out it, it evens out, you know, the bad tips outweigh are outweighed by the good tips, the, the bad customers are outweighed by the good customers. And, and she, if she could keep that perspective, it kind of probably kept fatigue and burnout at bay most of the time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, because, you know, every day, I'm sure that it's this balance of, you know, oh, I had this crazy customer today, or this horrible customer today. And then, you know, maybe another day, oh, I had this fantastic customer today. Um, And it is kind of this random assignment. And, you know, her point about the preset tips is interesting, because personally, I'm like, oh, I think preset tips would be great, because then when you get a crazy customer, it doesn't matter. But I hadn't thought of the other end of that spectrum, which is, if you get a great customer, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter either. Or um, the idea that no matter how hard you work, it doesn't matter. And so um, that hard workers and the lazy workers are rewarded the same. So I hadn't thought of that, but it's, it's an interesting angle. Structure of the kitchen. Quote, there is a structure to the kitchen and the dining room and learning it is a valuable lesson indeed. Dishwashers are on the very bottom rung of the ladder, clinging tenuously for their lives. Nobody ever saw the dishwashers. They were considered unclean, the untouchables, slaves of their own misfortune. Pantry workers were considered only one step up from the dishwashers because they didn't actually do any real cooking, even when they're responsible for more than just preparation. The chefs, or cooks, a not-so-subtle difference, had their own pyramid of power. Line cooks were at the bottom. They mostly, most often had less experience, got paid the least, never got to do any of the menu design and were forced to prepare eggs every morning. They were followed by the sous chef who got to do some menu planning and were allowed to boss line cooks and other kitchen workers around, and then executive chefs responsible for menu planning, design, ordering, and kitchen personnel. Chefs and cooks are an interesting breed. They work in a controlled frenzy, often producing mass quantities of food with individual specifications for each dish. They have a small space and a limited time frame in which to operate. They are responsible or for producing food that is not merely edible, but tantalizing and attractive. They And they do all of this, literally, in the fire. But most chefs receive very few accolades. They can't stroll around gathering compliments from the guests who eat their art. Instead, a chef has only the server as a link between him, or rarely her, and his public. Unfortunately, servers are often too busy with their own problems, usually that their food is coming out too late, to care about the chef's efforts. Clashes between the chef and his crew and the waitstaff are therefore routine. So it was no surprise that while there were some wars among the cooks, they were united on one point. They hated the waitstaff, end quote. The waitstaff were part of their own unique power structure, one that resembles the feudal pyramids of medieval times. At the bottom are the busboys. They have a symbiotic relationship with their servers. Neither can perform their job without the other. A waiter or waitress needs their handy slave to clean the tables, deliver bread, and refill water glasses. The busboy needs the tips. Hosts and hostesses are a cut above the busboys. 
They are given a considerable amount of power by virtue of the fact that they control the reservation book, the holy grail of the dining room. Servers are in the middle of the pyramid. They alone deal with the front and the back of house and are responsible for controlling all of the wild variables everywhere in between. Managers and owners make up the top of the dining room power structure, but salaried middle managers often make less money than the servers they police, leading to resentment and abuses of their power. Regardless of whether the manager is the owner or just one of many, they will have their eye on the cash flow. Customer service is important, but cash is king. The last thing a manager cares about is the wait staff. If the structure slips, the network becomes unbalanced and everyone suffers. I had no idea, I guess, to the intricacy and like closely had balance, um, you know, in, in the restaurant setting or the food service industry. I, I have not really worked in the food service industry, so uh, it's, I'm just experiencing it as a customer. But it seems like something that's so delicate and could easily tip and probably would tip towards a negative. Yeah, I had no idea. Um, well, that's not true. I had some idea of how delicate this pyramid scheme is. At the f there, so there's the back of the house and the front of the house. Um, I knew more at the front of the house, but that host hostess job, man, um, that be can become incredibly political, especially depending on how upscale the restaurant gets. The more upscale, the more political that job becomes. Because when they control the reservation book, they control what tables um, the waiter and waitresses get and how often those tables turn and who sits at those tables. Um, so that, that can become incredibly political. But the point about those middle managers making less than the waiter and waitresses and thus throwing their power around in order to sort of make up that ground or to make that balance, because if they don't get paid as much, well, at least they have power. Um, you know, that, that was interesting. But wow, you're right. What an intricate sort of uh, leveling and, and power structure that is. It's very tight power structure, you know, one literally sitting on top of the next, on top of the next, on top of the next. Um, and you can imagine that if, if there's even a slight shift in that balance, how the entire network can kind of topple over. And so, um, it, you know, if there's, if there's any kind of power brokering that's going on, um, how quickly sort of a restaurant almost could fall apart. Um, and so that that starts to, you know, throughout the book, Deborah talks about how, you know, when one little problem arises, how quickly the entire restaurant will topple. And now you can see why. Working the fantasy, waiting as a profession. Throughout the book, Deborah discusses waiting as a profession rather than as a passing job, as, w as one waits to start or to continue their another career. Quote, there are many questions I am able to answer with ease. What do you recommend this evening, for example? Or, which of your Chardonnays is the most buttery? I can even come up with quick responses to other more complicated questions, such as, what is the meaning of life? There is one question, however, that still gives me trouble. What do you do? Sometimes this question is asked by a customer who follows it with, I mean, when you're not here. As if serving to them is not really doing anything. Strangely enough, most of the waiters and waitresses I've worked with share this point of view. Most of them feel that it's not quite socially acceptable to say, I'm a waiter. Usually the response is more like, well, I'm an actor, artist, model, teacher, musician. They never seem able to admit that waiting is actually their profession. It's temporary living at best. End quote. At one point, Deborah held many jobs, including waitressing, reviewing books, editing, and working with children. Quote, Quote, sometimes I threw the waitressing out first to see what kind of reaction I get. After 20 years serving the public, I've developed a sixth sense about the social standards of various people. I know that some of the people I encounter in my neighborhood or through my son's school or even wait on consider restaurant work low class, something that immediately places me on a different social stratum. On the flip side, there are people who automatically feel more comfortable with me as one of the working class when they learn that I'm a waitress. My years of waiting tables are solely responsible for my ability to tell who's who, end quote. You know, and I was thinking about this, and it's interesting how we attach, like, disdain or shame to, like, these certain professions and that people have all of these preconceived notions or that they attach social status just based on, you know, what your profession is. And I thought, that's really interesting because I think we do the same thing. Oh, I'm a doctor. Oh, I'm a lawyer. You know, like, oh, I'm a neurosurgeon. And suddenly, oh, that 
this person's amazing. Um, and I think that's just fascinating rather than saying like, this is an amazing person. We judge people literally based on what their profession is. And I, you know, I, I just wonder to myself, wow, what kind of biases do we have to that? And it's making me more alert, um, as, as to myself and, and how I, how I judge people. Well, and if you think about you meet someone new or and you're trying to strike up conversation and one of, what are one of those first questions that you ask, you know, in, in any situation is, oh, so what do you do? Or what does your wife do? Or what does your husband do? And it's like, I think we have this need to, you know, uh, it helps us you know, categorize or identify or, um, you know, sort of describe that someone's identity by what their profession is. And I think that, uh, I think it's just natural for us to want to do that. But at the same time, I think it's really hard when um, we people err on the side of uh, tying someone's identity too closely to what they do or what they don't do, or if they're in a job transition, or if they're unemployed. I mean, none of that, sh- you know, it, it can't devalue that person because they're still a person. And so I think that it just, I think to me, it indicates how narrow or broad someone's perspective is if they're judging a person on their profession alone. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting. It's definitely part of, I think, part of our identity. And I have hopped around in my life profession to profession. Um, and so when people ask me, well, what do you do? I think for me, it's complicated because I do now something different than I did before. So it's more, I look, when people ask me, what do I do? I look at, I look at the question more as who are you? than what do I do right now? Sometimes other times I just look at it as, you know, what do I do right now? But I definitely feel judged when people ask me, well, what do you do now? Um, and part of that's just my sensitivity um, because I always feel this need to tell people what I did before as if they're judging me for what I do now. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. As if, if, as if what they think I do now isn't going to be good enough. So I have to tell them what I used to do because once they learn what I used to do, they're going to be like, oh, okay, well, that, that's a worthy profession. Um, and so I don't know. I, I feel I felt a little bit for Deborah and, and, and connected with her a little bit because what I do now definitely isn't, you know, as well, I think it's as intellectual as what I did before, but most people wouldn't. If they knew what I did now versus what I did before, they'd be like, oh, well, that's not even close in comparison, but it is. Um, it's just not known well. So people just don't know. Well, and I was just thinking, and maybe our listeners out there have ideas. I'd love like a little quick hit list of other questions I could ask to like open up conversation with people that kind of helped, uh, you know, still kind of connect to that person, but not risk like only tying their identity to their profession. But you want to know what people, you know, know, that's a very natural way. But is there a different phrased question that we could start incorporating that would like help, you know, keep an open conversation about it? You know what I love to do now? I love to say something like, um, one of my favorites now is when I meet new people, I'm like, oh, so I have this podcast that I do with a friend, um, (laughs) you know, and we read, we talk about all these books about really strong women throughout history and today. Um, you know, and so that generally opens, you know, they'll be like, oh, that's really cool. And I said, yeah, I said, that's something I love to do as a hobby. Um, what do you like to do? And so Mm -hmm. it it gets them talking about a hobby rather Mm -hmm. than talking about their work. And generally people are, are open to sharing about a hobby. Um, and so, you know, people can do hobbies across any kind of walk of life. You know, people can be a sea kayaker and they can be a neurosurgeon. They can be a sea kayaker and be a teacher. They can be a sea kayaker and be a waitress. And so it's less judgy, I think, um, to ask people, you know, about their hobby or about their kids or about something like that. And you got to be careful again with kids. Um, You know, I don't have kids. I'm 35. Um, You know, I don't have a marriage. I have a divorce. Um, you know, so you got to be careful around those kind of touchy subjects. But, um, you know, or, or I like talking about where I lived or where I traveled. Some people haven't traveled. So I don't know. It's I, I agree with you. It'd be interesting if our listeners want to just, you know, leave us a note on Facebook or something about, you know, questions that you've found that are really helpful. 
um, you know, as you're meeting people. Belinda. At an early part in her wait waitressing career, Deborah worked at a country club style restaurant that served higher end older diners. The dress code was strict for the wait staff, standards were high, and Deborah may have overstated her resume a bit when she interviewed. As a result, she was in over her head very early on. Generally, at restaurants, new wait staff are first put on the lunch shifts, which tend to be slower and easier to ensure that they can make it at the restaurant, and also to, so that they can learn the rhythm and intricacies of the restaurant. The lunch shifts are also the less de desirable of the shifts. There are less customers, so there are less tips. For Deborah, however, the lunch shift meant that she didn't have to handle the things that were most frightening, frightening about this particular job, the things that she had lied about on her resume, opening bottles of wine and carrying trays of holding six or more dinner plates. Eventually, her competence at lunch shined through, however, and she was moved to the dinner shift, and there she needed to open a bottle of wine at the table. At first, she managed to have other servers open it for her, until one night when she realized it was going to have to be her. She frantically looked around, and Belinda came to her rescue. Belinda was another waitress who had been there longer than Deborah. Belinda came over, a smile on her face, and helped Deborah open it. Belinda later taught her how to open the bottles at the table and also taught her how to carry the tray and how to put it down tableside without ripping her shoulder out of the socket. Belinda taught Deborah many other things as well, including how to have individuality in a sea of uniformity at the restaurant and how to be happy moving on when it was time to go. Belinda and Deborah became good friends and would follow each other out of that job and into another and onwards from there into other jobs, although not always together. They stayed friends long after. They would eventually lose contact, but in Deborah's writing, you could hear the respect and love she has for the woman who taught her how to uncork a bottle of wine tableside. I found this a really special uh, interaction, just that very first one that um, Deborah describes. And it, you know, it shows a lot of things. It shows grace. It shows the, the value of mentorship and reaching out to those next to us that we're working with. Uh, to help them along because it's going to benefit the whole the whole environment but it's it's I, I imagine it was a relief for Deborah yeah you know I think it's interesting I think every day we have this choice um, you know we can see someone struggling and every day we have that opportunity to either walk by or help them and I think sometimes we're so wrapped up in what we're doing and we're thinking in that moment you know, I've got to finish this project or I got to do this or, or so-and-so, you know, I got to go answer this email or something. And we, we, we walk right by. Um, and it's not necessarily that we're being mean. It's just that we're living in our own world. And so we're not paying attention or we're not looking for those opportunities to help others. And I think that Belinda really took that moment as she was seeing Deborah struggling to help her out. Um, and not just that moment, you know, she saw her struggling more times and her by, you know, by, by helping her out that first time, her eyes were kind of watching for Deborah a little bit. Um, and so she saw more of those moments to help her out. And then she took her time, um, her, her per, sort of personal time and, and really made that effort to be a mentor for her. And then, you know, they became great friends. Um, and, you, you know, you never know where those relationships are going to take you. But the fact that that she did that and that she took her time to do that, I think is really special. And I think so much, so much of our time these days is taken by things that, you know, we think are important, but I think it's important that something that we make time for are these types of things, if that makes any sense. Well, and we've seen it with other of our modern Athenas, uh, Tilda in the ICU as a nurse, you know, she had these mentors that kind of stepped in and helped her. And then uh, Candace, the FBI agent, she talked about um, the, uh, the other woman who helped her as well. And, uh, you know, it's Belinda's a modern Athena in, her, in the sense, too, you know, it's like we, we have to we have to, we need each other. Modern Athenas need each other, too, to to get navigate each day so we it, it's only in our best interest to keep our eyes um, open and our perspective broad for th to help those around us i agree a relationship with the chef deborah always built relationships with the wait staff of the restaurants she worked with it was hard not to they physically bumped into each other at the computer as they typed in their orders at the pickup window as they grabbed the hot plates for their diners at the swinging doors as they passed it in and out and sometimes voluntarily as all wait staffs are known for their trysts but deborah also learned early on that it paid to have a relationship with the chef quote 
I realized how important it was to have a good relationship with the chef at any restaurant. This was knowledge I carried, sometimes to the extremes, with me to every subsequent waitressing job, end quote. Having a good relationship with the chef, she realized, kept her food coming out in a timely, organized manner. The appetizers would come out hot and first, the main courses at the right interval after, the desserts to follow, the substitutions on the right plates, the right plates for the right tables, and, if she was very lucky, an entire night could be flawless. It was a waitress's dream. So she was really good and recognized really early on that it wasn't just about having relationships with your peer groups, but you had to watch sort of who in your process chain or sort of your decision-making chain every night and who sort of could be valuable to build those relationships with. And as I was sort of reading this, I was thinking in, t in terms of, you know, your workspace, um, you know, looking at your day-to-day -day work, who are those people that you that in your processes are valuable to build those relationships with that maybe you're not paying attention to because they're not in your peer group or directly in sort of that chain of command or your line of command or your supervisory line, however you, you look at your supervisory line, um, but that they could be really valuable to you if you spend a little time developing that relationship um, because they could end up providing you a lot of really beneficial support. Yeah. Like you said, Debbie, um, a little bit of time. And I think that actually, if we can all remember that it only really take it can, we can get a lot of benefit out of little actions, little decisions each day. It, we don't have to all of a sudden put a whole category of our to do list to, you know, make, you know, create a relationship with the chef. You know, it's just, it happens naturally. It happens organically. It hap you know, maybe she, you know, kept him updated or complimented him or, you know, expressed a, a need or it, I bet her time her communication was timely and it was clear and direct and um, but it also felt organic too and it's not forced um, and if we can just like readjust our our day a little bit to allow for those opportunities I think that that's how we can build upon those relationships and the other thing that you know I I have a word that I like to usually promote with my interns I say it's really important to have antennas <laughs> I, I, like that. I, I like that I like I like I like people who have antennas out like if you imagine they're always kind of aware and I'm Deborah has antennas you know we talked about it previously you know whether it's managing her customers or whatever but if you imagine that circular kind of radar screen where there's the blips you know you're just kind of always aware of these little faint subtle things around you and how you know maybe it's just in the spirit of teamwork, hey, you heard something over here that you know this person needs to know and you just pass it along because you hope, you know, you, you hope that other people do that for you too. But if you sow the seeds of that environment, uh, I think it's really beneficial. So I like antennas. <laughs> I know. I think that that's such an amazing way to look at it. I'm, I'm stealing that one. Work situations. Throughout the book, Deborah talks about so many funny, unfortunate, and common waitressing situations she has encountered in her decades of waiting. One in particular stands out. Deborah brought a woman her order of lasagna. The woman complained that the lasagna was not hot enough. One of the woman's companions said that she should just send it back to be nuked in the microwave. Deborah commented that they didn't have a microwave, but that she would take it back to be heated up. The woman said she didn't want that. She wanted it hotter, but she didn't want them to take the time to do it while everyone else was eating. So she wanted to complain, but she didn't want Deborah to do anything to fix it. Quote, I gazed at the woman helplessly. This is the type of situation I've encountered many times before at the table, but I'm still unable to come up with a suitable remedy. Perhaps if I offered to turn back time for her, I might be able to please her. But this was obviously not going to happen. Therefore, I am left with an impossible conundrum. End quote. Eventually, the woman tells Deborah that she'll eat it as is, but if she gets close to the end of it, she might call Deborah back and have her reheat it. So, Deborah should stay close by. Quote, I have to smile and nod assent. This, I think, is what it's all about. Complicated psychological interchanges with complete strangers taking place over contracted periods of time. I sign up for this kind of dialogue every time I approach a table. I am the waitress. My job is to serve. Of course, just what makes up the definition of the word serve is not as clear, end quote. Uh, I was reading this about the woman in the lasagna and thinking this must happen 
a hundred times a day because this happens in real life outside of the restaurant all the time. It's these people who you literally can't help because they refuse to help themselves, putting you in this precarious situations. I used to have these clients when I was an attorney. Same thing. They come to you for legal help. You can't help them because they refuse to let you help them. And they're infuriating. I have these people now in my current job. It's the same thing. You can't help them because they refuse to help themselves. Um, they, in essence, they blockade you from helping them. And you wonder, um, you know, what is it with them that sort of puts them in these situations and no matter how hard you try and move the barricade or go around the barricade or go over the barricade you can't help them and it, it makes sort of it makes you feel helpless and no matter how much compassion you try and give them um you know you you can't help them is <laughs> Is it any indication that I was breathing through my nose and out my mouth just trying to lower my blood pressure reading this passage? Because it was like, okay, it's going to be okay. Uh, you know, these, these patrons that um, are just, you know, it makes your blood boil, I would think. It made my blood boil. And Deborah, you know, she just seems to handle it. But yeah, it's like, what do you do? At some point, you just wish it, will, it, ends, it ends soon. But sometimes there's sticky clients or customers or patrons who have a complaint. Um, I work at an orchestra, so sometimes we'll get things via email after someone's been to a concert. And sometimes they're in the realm that I have to address. And honestly, I find it's best if I just kind of hit it head on in the sense that my instinct says, don't call this person back, you know, oh, I don't really want to deal with that. But actually, I call back and I just try to listen mostly but you know I ask you know is there you know please stay in touch let me know how it is next time you come back like almost like go a little bit overboard in a sense and they often are much more relaxed by the end and it doesn't always happen that way but sometimes you know playing into that oh it does improve the situation I have definitely tried that that going overboard and it definitely works sometimes. I mean, you got to play it. It only works with certain people, mm -hmm. but it definitely can work where you go so overboard where in essence, you're taking away all their ability to be aggressive. Um, and because you're giving them everything that they want. And I'm not saying you're necessarily giving the outcomes that they want, but you're giving them all of that, that feed, that emotional feed that they want. And so you're taking away all that, that aggression to the point of them becoming docile. And so when they become that way, you're, they sort of calm to the point of not, I mean, you're in essence, you're petting them. It's like a puppy, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're petting them. You've calmed them down now and they just kind of sit and they relax. Um, and so then moving forward, they kind of, they just, they're, they're, it's easier to deal with them. And then it's harder for them to get riled up the next time. Um, and so it's, it, you know, I don't know. It's easy moving. Well, forward. and if there's, if there's this slight window of opportunity and it's hard, I've just had this occur a couple times where you can actually play into them having the expertise and almost ask their advice about how to handle the situation differently next time. That can go, that can be like a total, like you made a best friend. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense, but like there's been a couple times where I've been able to almost turn the tables and say, well, how would you have handled that? And they just eat it up. <laughs> yeah. And that's good, but you also got to be careful with that. Cause if you're not ready to handle it the way that right. they suggest, um, they can also that can flip on you. So I think with that, you just got to know that however they suggest it, you're going to be willing to try that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> the theater. Waitressing is a bit like being part of the theater. Quote, I had always felt there was a certain anonymity to waitressing. After all, with the exception of the regulars, one's customers are different every day. Each table is a chance to display a fresh persona, even a new identity if one so desires. But in truth, one really has to have an act to wait tables. A certain shtick is necessary at the table. This is what the customer is paying for. The average patron couldn't care less if you've had a bad day, week, or month, and he resents it if he's forced to even consider this. He wants a smile, a dance, a bit of mystery. Every waiter and waitress I've worked with has developed a personality 
originality, especially for use at the table. One waiter I worked with, for example, was a dead ringer for the actor Rowan Atkinson. He exploited this resemblance for all it was worth. Another waiter I worked with performed magic tricks at the table. Waiters and waitresses who hail from countries other than the United States generally have an easy time presenting a restaurant persona. I've been consistently amazed at how easily impressed most people are by an accent of any kind. In fact, I've seen countless transgressions forgiven by customers just because the waiter or waitress was French, Italian, or Spanish. I've exper experimented with this one myself. One of my talents is the ability to mold my speech patterns and accent whomever, whomever I'm talking to. A British accent is especially easy, as is a New York twang. At the table, I've util utilized both, usually to great effect, end quote. So I think this is brilliant. Deborah kind of is talking about almost like, you know, mirroring so the way she, the it sounds like the tool, uh, the t technique she uses is almost mirroring her customer, you know, and I bet that familiarity in a subtle way. Um, I mean, there's like hostage negotiators that talk about this, but familiarity and comforting it is comforting to people uh, because they kind of want to be understood whether or not they even realize that that's happening. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just fascinating. It made me think, Hmm. I wonder when I go to a restaurant, <laughs> you know, and what kind of smoke and mirrors is going on. Um, but yeah, I, it, this dinner theater sort of thing is just, uh, it's very interesting. And I think this kind of goes back to the tip and the psychology of reading your customer and, and, and what they want. Well, and I live in the South, um, in Tennessee. And of course, you know, Nashville is actually a very, I guess, cosmopolitan place. So you don't necessarily you can go for a, a, a lot of places within downtown and not necessarily hear a Tennessee accent or a Southern accent. But if you go somewhere and you do, it's very charming, especially if someone says, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. That is like one of the most diffusing term uh, phrases. And I, I love it. Um, and I actually use it sometimes, uh, especially if I'm dealing with a customer. Yes, ma'am. I'm so sorry, ma'am. You know, I mean, it's because it's, it shows respect, but it actually has like a, almost like a, must be a, a high blood pressure medication. <laughs> it just, it really does have an effect that um, is maybe regional, but it, it, it's, it's pretty magical. Yeah. If you did that up here in the Pacific Northwest, you'd tweak somebody out. So it's definitely <laughs> probably, it's definitely probably, it's funny because when you get out of the military at the beginning, it's, it's second nature to do that. And you've got to like untrain yourself to do that depending on where you live. Um, Cause again, like up here, it, it, it just tweaks people. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's interesting yet up here, there's different, different things that you do that make people feel very comfortable. Um, and so, oh, I did say Pacific Northwest, right? Yeah, that's where mm -hmm. I am. So it's, um, it just, I, I think you got to kind of know the culture you're in um, and, and where you're at. So I'm sure the dinner theater changes for waiters and waitresses, depending, you know, regionally and, and where they're at. But um, it's definitely an interesting idea. And I think that people use it in the workplace and in their, um, you know, daily lives as well. You kind of become this chameleon and you kind of change yourself depending on the situations that you're in, right? You you interact with your boss in a different way than you're going to interact with your coworkers. It's not that you as a person are really changing, but you're definitely going to be changing the way that you talk and the way that you put your sort of put yourself out there. Um, I think that everybody does. Um, you know, you're not going to be joking around with your boss the same way you're joking around with your co-worker who you've known for you know five years uh, you know I hopefully you're not making emails that different because um, it's in writing and it's permanent and if you ever get into a litigation situation those emails are going to be plopped in front of you hint hint um, but uh, again I think those verbal interactions you 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 are very different well and I think in a way that I've had to kind of un unlearn some of the chameleon nature uh, I've had uh, is because when I was growing up we moved around um, quite a bit actually so I was the new kid in school probably four or five times um, in my uh, uh, upbringing and so I actually was a very good chameleon in a way because I had to be and I was the new kid in school and so I would make all these new friends and different friends and everything and um, in a way it, it was it was kind of strange because by the time I got to adulthood you know I was kind of like well what what do I like you know it was kind of like what is my identity and, and and everything so it was it's interesting how you said leaving the 
military, you had to kind of unlearn these these techniques and in a way. Um, now I feel like I, the pendulum swung back, but also I have that ability still to kind of um, feel comfortable in lots of different settings. Like, I mean, I can, I can pr- almost get along with anyone with at least external, you know, in an external way. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating that the, the waitressing and, you know, profession really requires this broad spectrum of ability and it can go so unnoticed, but blaze. Deborah unexpectedly got pregnant and was not with the father when she found out about the pregnancy. It was clear early on in the pregnancy that he was unlikely to be in the child's life. Just about that time, her father, who had been in the restaurant business before, decided to open up a Brooklyn-esque family-run pizza eatery. Deborah, Deborah came to help run Peppy's. It turned out that Peppy's was a transition point for her. From her single days of bouncing around various restaurants, living the transient lifestyle common and waiting, to a need for more steady employment with the arrival of her son, Blaze. Quote, for me, Peppy's had provided a place between two very different phases of life. I had a new identity, that of a single mother, and all of my decisions from that point on would be pre- predicated on the needs of a person other than myself. I was no longer an observer of my own life. I was an active participant. I was amazed at how irrelevant the problems I thought I had, I'd had before having Blaze, Blaze seemed. Self-indulgent crises about my place in the world seem meaningless when compared to the visceral reality of a baby's midnight fever. Blaze's health and well-being came first, and everything else would have would have to get in line behind it. I had become, in effect, one of the real per- people in the world around me. From the first seconds of his ex- his existence, I knew that Blaze was not a project to be worked on sporadically or when I felt inspired. He could not he could not be gone back to later and I couldn't edit my mistakes. I could never rewrite my part in his life. He was therefore my work. Everything else would have to wait. End quote. So I think we probably all have this, these transition points that we can point to that have kind of come unexpectedly or uh, just so dramatically changed our lives that I think in what I think really happens at those points is our perspective changes and our perspective broadens. And Deborah articulated that really well. And, you know, it's, it's so important. And I I think it only can come with time a lot of the time. And, you know, even when our perspective has broadened, and we feel like we realize we were being very trivial about certain things that we're upset about, we can still fall back into that, though. And, um, I don't know, I have my theories about how we can keep ourselves or keep that perspective in our day, day to day, even when we fall into um, those moments that are much more narrow minded. But what what do you think about all that? I think that when you have these sort of life events that change your perspective, I would agree, I think that the danger is falling backwards again and forgetting about the radical changes that you've had. And so I I agree. I think that you need to remind yourself of that, whether that's putting something up on your wall or journaling or having a little mantra that you tell yourself or really having some kind of change in your daily routine or really fixating on really changing your life. So changing your path that you're traveling permanently um, or, you know, having some dramatic change in your daily disciplines or whatever it may be um, that's really going to make that difference for you. But if you make no change, if you say, wow, I've had this, you know, dramatic change in, in my perspective on how I view life, and then you literally go back to exactly how you were living before, you've had no change at all. I mean, maybe for five seconds you have, but you haven't really had a change in your perspective on how you view life because you go backwards right to where you were before. So you had maybe a 10 second pers- a, a, a look not so much in your perspective change. You've just had a view for five seconds. Um, You've had like a flash in a pan. Um, and so I think that if you really want your perspective to change, you've got to do some work um, that to, and follow through on it. And I think that, you know, where she was talking about, you know, it 
once Blaze arrived, everything changed for her. And you can literally see she's giving you what I would call physical things that changed. Um, she can't edit her mistakes. It's not about her anymore. Baby's midnight fever. Um, physical things that have now turned that she you know, in, in essence, her life path has changed physically. She can't go backwards. And I think that if that happens to you, I think that's really when your perspective actually changes. Out of context. It's a Saturday afternoon and Deborah is standing in line at a department store coffee shop while a couple stands next to her pondering the sandwich menu. The line is fairly slow moving. They've made their selection. They glance over at her. In a flash of recognition, she knows who they are. They are customers. They, however, do not seem to recognize her. Hello, how are you? I ask them, smiling. Great, the man says. How are you doing? Terrific, I respond. It's funny running into you here, he says. He's fishing, hoping I'll say something or give a sign of who I am. I like this place, I tell him. They've got great coffee here. Yes, he answers. The man's wife leans into him and whispers in that whisper that everyone can hear, asking him where they know her from. He can't remember, but Deborah can. And she sees his face, feeling some emotions attached to seeing Deborah, but being unable to place them. Deborah could help him out, but she doesn't. She does walk through in her mind everything she knows about them, how they always want to know about the specials, how he will want a cappuccino at the end of the meal, how he'll leave the check on the table for 10 minutes before laying his credit card on top of it. They are regulars, and recently they have been smiling at her when they come into the restaurant. They've been acknowledging her, but now in the line at the department store coffee shop, they can't place her. Quote, I must assume, therefore, that I'm doing a good job at playing my part, and my part is determined not so much by how well I perform my job, but how close I am to the image of a waitress that these two have in their minds. I played it so well, in fact, that they are completely unable to attach an identity to me outside of the restaurant. The relationship is working well. Why ruin it by telling them who I am? Outside of the restaurant, I had no identity. I was out of my environment, but more important, I was out of character. I never did explain who I was to that couple. I did, however, wait on them again. The next time I saw them, they gave no indication that they'd run into me anywhere else. When I approached their table, the husband smiled and asked me, Will you be serving us tonight? Yes, I replied. I am your waitress. End quote. I, this is probably the one situation in the entire book. That it broke my heart when I first read it. And then the other part of me thought, wow. We know people in context, and I think a lot of us want to compartmentalize how we know people because when we pull them out of that context and we move them over to a different context, it kind of ruins the aura that we have around them or sort of this fairy tale that we might have around them, um, or in the case of some people, um, not so much a fairy tale, um, you know, like if it's a work person, it, it blows that up for us. Uh, maybe it makes them a real person rather than just the work person or, you know, so I think that we like compartmentalizing people. Um, we build those artificial walls around them. And, and I think that we, for the most part, we want those there. Yeah, I think when those walls are there, we, you know, we don't feel obligated to be compassionate or, you know, to really forge connection, uh, you know, and um, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you think about those people that in my life, you know, I think growing up, everybody thought like their teachers growing up weren't real people, like, cause like they, that they could have actual lives outside of the classroom. And, and I, I mean, I think we probably actually all thought about our parents that way at a certain age. And then, you know, as we grow up, we realize everybody does have these lives outside of these, this small context that we know them. Um, but, you know, I think that you're right, that these walls that in this compartmentalization just prevents and whether it's voluntary or involuntary, the compassion and connection that we really would feel obligated to um, provide because these are real people and we, we don't have to care about them if we, if we only compartmentalize them and keep them in their little box of where we want them. Burnout. Quote, servers burn out for similar reasons. As I did, many find themselves suddenly wondering where all that time went and why they are still working a job that was 
meant to only be a temporary source of income. Some develop a general intolerance for management and start griping about unfair treatment. Other waiters and waitresses grow tired of the servile aspect of the job and find themselves unable to cope with customer demands and complaints. The attitude of the burned out server is the first casualty. And attitude, of course, is everything. Having a bad one more or less guarantees a lousy tip. And the waiter's complaints about his customers become self-fulfilling prophecies. In one case, a couple ordered white Zinfandel, and the waiter claimed it was an unsophisticated order, and the diners, picking up on his disdain, left a low tip. Occasionally, however, it's not just the attitude of the burned-out waiter that sours. Some servers begin exacting revenge in small but meaningful ways. One waiter refused to bring water to the table, making his customers wait and become so parched that they were almost screaming with thirst. He took perverse pleasure in making them suffer. Others feel compelled to try to protect their income while pursuing their vendettas against humanity. In these cases, tampering with leftovers before they are packaged to go is a particular favorite. There's also the practice of splitting dishes. I don't recommend having your waiter or waitress split the dish before it arrives at the table because, quite literally, the splitting may be done by hand. There are still other passive-aggressive ways for a waitress to get back at the customers she feels are persecuting her. Revenge, they say, is a dish best served cold. Or perhaps scaldingly hot, which is how a soup is served when a customer really demands a reheat. Chances are even greater, though, that the server has encountered some very challenging customers and has simply lost the ability to cope. I've never seen waiters or waitresses punish a customer who treated them decently or respectfully or who acknowledged, even in the smallest of ways, their service, the service they were receiving. It really does pay to be nice to your server, end quote. And, you know, here I think it comes back to that, you know, lack of humanity that some people uh, attach to these and we'll talk about these kind of invisible people in our lives or people that have the tendency to, we just kind of tend to walk by and how important it really is to treat each other as humans. And, uh, you know, because we're all going to be on either side of this kind of coin at any time of our lives and multiple times in a month or a day or a week. And, you know, it, she just articulates it so well the 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 real symbolism and meaning behind these mi- those kind of miniature interactions yeah and i mean i think more than anything the burnout burnout's real and i think that you know listening to her talk about the burnout and the different examples of burnout i think that everybody in their profession is is at risk for burnout and i think it's recognizing those signs you know she's giving here a litany of signs um after you've re- after they've reached burnout but i think it's being sensitive to that self care need Um, before you hit that burnout mark and just checking in with yourself, you know, how many days in a row have you worked? Um, How long has it been since you've taken a mental health day? How long has it been since you've taken vacation? Um, You know, just really focusing a little bit on that check-in, you know, just making sure, I, I know everybody's very, very busy, but just make sure that you're doing that every so often. You know, if you're listening to our podcast every week, maybe you do that self check in when you're done listening to our podcast at the very end, three minutes, you know, how am I feeling this week? You know, has it been a tough week? Um, you know, maybe I need to take an extra hour and go get that massage or an extra hour and take that walk. Um, you know, maybe I need to get an extra run in, um, you know, whatever it may be so that you can decompress just that little bit more and take that edge off. Well, maybe another measure I'm thinking now for myself of how burnt out or not burnt out I am is how much compassion do I feel for others? How much, per, how broad is my perspective right now? Because I think the less I want to, you know, feel compassion for others and do, you know, and the narrower my perspective and the more focus on me and my problems and, and unfairness and all that can be a real indicator that you are being burnt out and you need to, you know, do something to turn things around. Deborah walks away. Eventually, Deborah too gets burned out. It was a slow decline, the same as she explained others suffered, but she knew it was time when she had lost the anonymity she relied on at the table, when regulars started knowing more about her life than she wanted them to know, when the children she knew turned into adults with children of their own. She had already taken steps to no longer be solely reliable on waitressing. She had long ago attained a bachelor's degree in English, and she had been in and out of the editing and publishing fields for many years. She leaned on her contacts and was able to secure a good full-time job at a publishing firm and quickly made her exit from waitressing. 
But the job wasn't for her. She quickly fell into a deep unhappiness. Theoretically, it should have been a dream job, a great personal advancement. But she missed the adrenaline, and she missed the money and could she could have been making in far less working hours. Quote, I could have gone on like this indefinitely and perhaps turned into a very bitter, unfulfilled person who blamed the very work she had fought to get for her own misery. Because in the end, there were no sparking revelations. I had lost my ability to see the forest for the trees. Ultimately, it was Blaze who came to my and his own rescue. End quote. Her son needed more support at school and working her new job during the day was not compatible with his special needs. Her decision was made for her. And as she had said years ago when she first had Blaze, she couldn't rewind time and fix a mistake with him. She had to get this right the first time. So she quit her job and went back to waitressing so that she could support him by volunteering at his school during the day. But this time it wasn't just about the waitressing. She was able to volunteer at Blaze's school during the day to be there for him. And she could waitress at night, but she was also finding time to write, which was her passion. This time she was finding balance. Quote, I realized, too, that it's not always necessary to know how things are going to turn out, and perhaps the most valuable lesson I'd learned was that the act of waiting itself is an active one. That period of time between the anticipation and the beginning of life's events is when everything really happens, the time when actual living occurs. I'd spent so much time worrying about the outcome of my life that I'd forgotten how to live it. I'd also come to know that not everything was fraught with a vast and complicated meaning. Sometimes it was only about timing the order just right, recommending a particularly good dessert, or making a friend out of a stranger at my table. I began to see not only the simplicity of these acts, but also their beauty, end quote. So, you know, I, I'm really thankful that Deborah has been able to share kind of her wisdom with us, because I almost don't, I, I don't think it's, you can ever hear too much the value of remembering the small things and to really live life to its fullest. I, I, I can't re be reminded enough of that. And the other thing I think she really shows is that sometimes there's these things in our lives that we keep coming back to again and again at different points and they kind of take on different meaning and there's more depth to those things, whether it's a, an activity or a person or a place. Um, but what do you think? Well, I think it was really poignant how, you know, she thought she was tr tracing this dream of leaving waitressing. You know, she finally got this publishing job and, and you know, she finally thought, okay, I'm getting out of waitressing. I'm, I'm chasing this publishing dream of mine. And then, you know, Blaze's special needs really sort of forced her out of that and forced her back into waitressing. And instead of looking at it as that, instead of looking at it as her losing her dream, she looked at it as an opportunity and she looked at it as, okay, now I can write in essence, write this book. Um, and she can follow her own passion. And instead of looking at it as a negative, she looked at it as a beautiful gift. Um, and when she went back to waitressing, she came back to it with a whole different perspective. And she saw it's not always necessary to learn and to know how things are going to turn out, right? So this was a this was a sea change for her um, that she hadn't anticipated, right? So she had changed her direction in life, and now she was changing it again, and she didn't know where it was going, but she realized that's okay too. Um, and so uh, this was kind of a, a a change in self sort of her journey um, and her little uh, way of of knowing that her self-discovery um, is also growing and changing. And so I think that this was part of the book um, that I really connected to. And I thought this would be great for our readers to hear um, or our listeners to hear um, and, and connect to our sort of group of books about learning their journey um, and, and their self-discovery where it's not always necessary to know what the next step is going to be or, or how things are going to turn out because in the end we don't know how they're going to turn out and if you try and plan for how they're going to turn out like Deborah did it's never going to turn out the exact way that you think it's going to and so here are some final thoughts on today's podcast while we may pay a psychologist $150 an hour to listen to our problems, we don't seem to worry about telling the same problems to our waiter or waitress because that's what the tip is for, right? While we would never think to demand that our spouse bring us another drink after we've sat down at the dinner table or demand that they change the side dish that they already cooked for Sunday brunch, we don't think twice to demand that our waiter or waitress do these same things because that's what's part of what we're entitled to as a customer, right? Right. 
And if we're in deep conversation with our dinner companions, when our waiter or waitress steps up to our table to take our order, they can just wait a minute for us to finish our conversation, right? Well, that depends. It depends on what kind of a person we are. J.K. Rowling, author of the Harry Potter books, is quoted as saying, if you want to know what a man is like, take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. We all know what kind of people we think we are, respectful and well-mannered, thoughtful and kind, generous. But the truth is that more often than not, we really aren't, at least not when we're talking about being customers, because when we're in situations where we are customers, we get the sense of entitlement. Now, don't get all defensive. Just listen to what I have to say and think about it for a minute. I can find out what you're really like as a customer very easily. All I have to do is to take you with me to a very crowded, very busy restaurant on a Friday or Saturday night and then watch. Watch your interactions with the hostess, with the busboy, and with our waiter or waitress. But I don't really have to take you to a restaurant to find that out. All I have to do is to look at how you treat all the other invisible people in your life. Invisible people? Yeah, invisible. The people who you come into contact with on a daily basis that are invisible to you because they don't matter to you. The waitstaff of your daily world. They're your barista at your Starbucks who make your drink for you in the morning. The man in your work parking lot who hands you the little ticket stub for your car as you race to make your morning meeting. The woman checking out the grocery sto- checking you out at the grocery store as you grab the missing ingredients for dinner. The UPS man dropping off your Amazon package at your front door at 8 p.m. Let me pause for a second while you sit there and think of the rest of the invisible people in your daily life. There are a half dozen to a dozen of them. Okay, do you have most of them? Now, are you satisfied with how you treat them all? I mean, do you even interact with them? Or do you just pretend that they don't exist as you have this awkward exchange of goods and services? I'm just curious because did you even know that the barista at Starbucks just got a new puppy? The woman behind you yesterday in line does. And she knows his name, too, because when she went in to grab her morning latte with three extra shots and two pumps of hazelnut, yikes, the barista and her co-worker were talking about the puppy, so the woman asked what the puppy's name was when she ordered her drink. The puppy's name is Freckles, by the way, in case you were curious. You didn't even notice the conversation was happening, and you didn't even say thank you for your drink when the other barista handed it off to you. A little sense of entitlement right there, I think. Did you know that the woman who checked you out at the grocery store last night just finally got her young son off to college? The man behind you did because he noticed that she was wearing a button that said, Proud Mom of State U Grad, Class of 2021. Not sure how you missed that button or the Proud Mom shirt she was wearing. No, wait, I am. You were reading those trashy gossip magazines and thumbing through your phone, checking your work email as she was beaming right at you and asked if you were having a good evening. You couldn't even be bothered to say hello back, could you? A bit rude, if you ask me. And did you know that the UPS driver just had his firstborn son three days ago? Your next-door neighbor noticed because the proud papa had a photo of his son in his ID badge holder when he delivered your neighbor's Amazon package right before he delivered yours. You didn't even notice the driver's ID badge holder because when you opened the front door, you grabbed the box and almost slammed the door closed in his face. After all, it was 8 p.m., you had had a long day, your glass of wine was waiting, your TV show was just coming on, and the package was late. I'm just going to leave this one alone. No comments needed. You didn't notice freckles or the button or the baby because you can't be bothered to care about these people. That's because subconsciously you believe that you're better than they are, that you're more important than they are, and that your life is more important than theirs. You believe that your time is more valuable than theirs, and at some level you don't believe that whatever they have to say is worth your time at all. That's because your ego is too big and you don't respect people. You have a sense of entitlement. Maya Angelou once said that people will will forget what you said and what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. I think that's true. It isn't about the fact that the woman found out the puppy's name is Freckles or that the man found out that the woman had gotten her younger son off to college or that the man found out that the driver's son had just been born. It was that these customers got got to share in the feeling of these moments, the joy and the happiness. Isn't that worth setting aside your ego and sense of entitlement to share in? I bet that when the the barista sees the woman today, and when the checker sees the man at the grocery store the next time, and when the UPS driver drops off the next Amazon box at your neighbor's house, each of them will have a little quirky smile for their customer because they'll remember the feeling that their customer gave them. That's what Maya Angelou was saying.
It's true that sometimes we lose track of ourselves in the frenetic chaos of life. So this is a good opportunity to pause and really think about what we want to be reflecting to others when we meet and greet them as a customer. My guess is that you want to be that respectful, well-mannered, thoughtful, kind, and generous person that you always have thought you were, rather than the ego-driven, disrespectful, self-centered, entitled one that you've become. It's easy to see how you got to where you are now. It was a slow and gradual decline, one customer service interaction at a time. But you don't have to stay there. It doesn't have to be this long, slow, uphill climb to find your way back to where you want to be either. All you have to do is open your eyes and open your heart. Smile. Say hello. You'll be surprised at the smile you'll get in return. And yes, maybe you'll learn about Freckles' antics or the son's first college semester or the baby's first steps. Or... Maybe you'll even learn about the parking attendant's first day as a new U.S. citizen. But no matter what, you'll become the person you always wanted to be. And you'll realize that the only person who these people were invisible to to was you. And that is Rowling's point. And I think that's all we have for today. Thanks for listening to Deborah's stories and for sharing this experience with us. You can also interact with us, follow us, and learn about upcoming episodes on our website at modernathenas.com, on our Facebook page under Modern Athenas, our Twitter at Modern Athenas, and our Instagram at the Modern Athenas Podcast. We would also appreciate if you support our podcast by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher and subscribing to the podcast. In our next podcast, we will be discussing the book Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight, An African Childhood by Alexandra Fuller. As we leave you today, we want to remind you to never forget that each of you, like all the modern Athenas we have discussed on our podcasts, has the power and capacity to be a change maker in your world. Work hard, dream big, and reach for the stars.